So we are asking everybody for this day to start dropping the S in ocean because there is only one big ocean. Now, without any further ado, I invite the host to put on screen the special message of the UNESCO Director General, Madame Audrey Azoulay. Please. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be welcoming you to the first online Ocean Literacy Summit organized on the occasion of World Oceans Day 2020. Today we celebrate our ocean, which is home to remarkable biodiversity. It is the defining physical feature of this planet and the regulator of the Earth's climate. 2020 was poised to be a major year for the ocean. A major United Nations Ocean Conference was set to gather the global ocean community in June. A much-awaited climate conference of parties was expected to bring the ocean climate nexus back into the limelight. Another key conference of parties was due to establish the next global targets for the protection of bio biological diversity. Much like COVID-19, the challenges facing the ocean do not respect borders. Left unchecked, ocean acidification, marine pollution, sea level rise and low oxygen dead zones could have harmful effects, not just in terms of global climate change, but also on the billions of people who depend on the ocean for their food and livelihoods. In the face of COVID-19, World Ocean Days 2020 is key to relying the global ocean community, strengthening international collaboration and maintaining momentum for decisive and innovative action. This is particularly important as we move towards the launch of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development next January. The Ocean Decade is a unique opportunity to shape a global framework for ocean actors from all countries, disciplines, generations and sectors to generate and use ocean science for transformative change. But innovation and action can only happen when knowledge is available to everyone. This is the essence of ocean literacy, sharing knowledge to drive action. In the words of oceanographer Sylvia Earle, far and away the biggest threat to the ocean is ignorance. Improvements in ocean literacy are key to sustain innovative approaches to the management of the ocean. This challenge requires the creation of partnerships and networks among UN entities and governmental, non-governmental and international organizations using strategies that go far beyond conventional policy making. But it also requires the empowerment of communities, network of business leaders, industry, universities, research centre, civil society at large to share responsibility for addressing urgent threats. For many years now, UNESCO has helped develop ocean knowledge and awareness through the work of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, which was established 60 years ago. The IOC monitors the impact of climate change on oceans, supports progress in scientific cooperation and knowledge. Thanks to its Ocean Biodiversity Information System, it is the leading source of data on the movement of marine species around the world. By assessing changes, it helps prepare coastal communities and small island developing states for future flood risks. Today, it's the first ever online Ocean Literacy Summit, which gathers ocean experts, uh, educators, artists, scientists, businesses, uh, people of sports, policy makers. And it is, I believe, a tremendous occasion to contribute to this challenge and to celebrate World Oceans Day. Excellencies, dear friends, we cannot miss this opportunity for today's generation and for the generations to come. It's our responsibility. As French poet Charles Baudelaire wrote, the sea is our mirror in which we contemplate our soul. Homme libre, toujours tu chériras la mer. La mer est ton miroir, tu contemples ton âme. And on those words, I wish you an excellent summit. Thank you to the Director General of UNESCO. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Vladimir Ryabinin, the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. Uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, uh, all courtesies observed, uh, I am pretty sure that the next speaker will say the same. Uh, happy World Oceans Day. Uh, thank you, Francesca, for giving me the floor and being instrumental for in organizing this important event. So indeed, it is my great pleasure to speak at the opening of the first ever World Ocean Summit, uh, World Ocean Summit, or oh, excuse me, o Ocean Literacy Summit, on behalf of the, of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, or simply IUC. So I would like to quote, uh, because we are part of UNESCO, I would like to quote the UNESCO motto, wars start in the minds of men. Because of that, it is in the minds of men that defenses of peace have to be constructed. The idea of changing, changing not the climate, but minds of people is also uh, the vision of the UNESCO climate strategy. And also would like following uh, the Director General of UNESCO to repeat the famous phrase of uh, Silvia Earle, that ignorance is by far the biggest threat to the ocean. So ocean literacy aims to uh, basically open mind, open hearts of people when it comes to the ocean using the same approach. So we are meeting virtually because of the coronavirus. And of course, the coronavirus has changed the world. And also we need to change the world ourselves. The world needs more care, empathy, needs more understanding. Otherwise, I think we are going to the period of dark age. So those who are going to speak today and also who, who are going to attend the meeting, and I see now already 440 participants, uh, we are all very lucky people because we are dealing with the ocean. Ocean is beautiful and it is for us a very favorable environment to change the world through the help of our dear friend, the ocean. So, of course, the main goal of our community is to protect the ocean for the sake of ocean itself and also uh, for the sake of us people. Uh, the main idea of this uh, noble undertaking is relatively si simple. It is the lack of care or ignorance, once again, that have, uh, had, has, uh, have led to massive deterioration of the ocean health. And knowledge is the key to restore the ocean. But also, like in the case of coronavirus, there is no way to return to the past way of life because the past way of life was not normal. So for the ocean, the new normal uh, that we are trying to actually uh, to make sure that it works, and also this is because humans need to use the ocean, can be summarized in three words. Integrated ocean management. This means marine protected areas, coastal zone management, marine special planning, adaptation mitigation to climate change, fisheries and aquaculture management, assessment of risks, uh, creation of warning systems, and eventually those systems would lead insurability of the coastal areas to creating a new sustainable ocean economy. And it is the science that make, uh, may make this all possible. And this is exactly why IOC proposed to United Nations and United Nations agreed to dedicate next 10 years, starting 2021, uh, as the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So during this uh, 10 years to come, please expect a breakthrough in ocean observations, data management, ecosystem understanding, mapping of ocean bottom, creating an ocean genetic image, production of more food and renewable energy for people through science, and better use of those resources. And uh, uh, we formulated 10 challenges of the decade, and one of them is not to leave anyone behind. So that we not only move forward at the cutting edge of science, but also creating conditions so that everyone could participate in science and also benefit from it, including Africa and small island developing states. So um, the decade uh, challenge number 10 is about two issues. We need first to ensure that the multiple values of the ocean for human well-being, culture, sustainable development are recognized and widely understood. And the second, we need to identify and, and overcome barriers to the behavior change required for change humanity's relationship with the ocean. So one of our societal goal, uh, outcomes of the decade is formulated as inspiring and engaging ocean, where society values the ocean in relation to human well-being. To incite the, the business needed behavior change, there needs to be a step change in society in relation with the ocean. 
And this can be achieved through ocean literacy approaches and other uh, ways to create awareness about uh, ocean and also, of course, uh, uh, through a change in, in the school curricula. So, dear colleagues and friends, it is basically your most important societal role to make ocean literacy work and by that to open the door for systematic and welcome use of ocean science to save our ocean. IC cannot do this alone and would like to thank many wonderful partners who became friends and with whom together we will continue our journey on the road to make our civilization ocean literate. With regard to this summit, there are so many contributors. I cannot name them all, but I'd like to thank them all. What specifically I would like following also Francesca uh, to thank OceanWise for hosting this platform uh, uh, for, for this meeting and also Eurogoose and, and, and also Experimental Atelier for supporting us vis-a-vis -vis the content and organization of this event. So once again, thank you all for doing this, for moving the ocean literacy forward. Once again, happy World Oceans Day, and I would like to wish you a very successful summit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vladimir. And I'll now uh, give the floor to Megan Rowley, who will be the moderator of the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. My name is uh, Megan Rowley, and I am a journalist with the Thomson Reuters Foundation, uh, which is the charitable part um, of Reuters News. And we've been covering uh, climate change for well over a decade now. And within that uh, context, um, we have been looking at the impact of, of global warming on the oceans um, and on biodiversity. Um, and today I am going to introduce our keynote speaker first, and then we're going to move to our first uh, panel discussion of the day. And just to introduce the subject, um, ocean literacy is defined as the understanding of human influence on the ocean and the ocean's influence on people. It's not just about increasing awareness of the state of the ocean, it's also about providing tools and approaches that can transform ocean knowledge into actions that promote ocean sustainability. So first we're going to hear uh, from Peter Thompson, who is the UN Special Envoy for the Ocean on why we need ocean action and the role of ocean literacy. And just to introduce Peter briefly, he was appointed in October 2017 as the first Special Envoy for the Ocean of the UN Secretary General. And in that role, he drives the implementation of SDG 14, which is a sustainable development goal to conserve and sustainably use the resources of the ocean. He's a Fijian diplomat who has also served as president of the UN General Assembly and as Fiji's permanent representative to the United Nations. Peter, please. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, well, thanks for that introduction. Uh, and yes, indeed, all courtesies observed. And greetings to everyone gathered with us here in cyberspace. I hope that whatever your circumstances, that you and your families are safe and well. I'd like to thank the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission for the invitation to address you all at the Virtual Ocean Literacy Summit today. And I thank you also to OceanWise, Eurogoose, and Experiential Atelier for partnering in the hosting of this virtual summit. Happy World Ocean Day to everyone. And joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea and to all those other wonderful marine life forms with whom we share this planet. This morning I was in Stockholm delivering a speech at Sweden's World Ocean Day celebrations. I told them I had to bid adieu and hop onto my magic carpet so that I could whiz down here to be with you in Paris. From here I got to zoom across the Atlantic, the UN's World Ocean Day celebrations in New York, and then zoom back to London to join a World Ocean Summit panel convened by the economists. The day will be complete with a webinar shared with the Pacific Islands Forum based out of Fiji. All this travel with zero carbon emitted. Many of you will have participated last week in the virtual ocean dialogues organized by the Friends of Ocean Action and the World Economic Forum. The global outreach of those dialogues was quite astounding to me. Over 600,000 viewers across all platforms for the main sessions of the dialogues. We're still gathering the positive lessons learned from the virtual ocean dialogues, but I, for one, foresee future conferences as hybrid models that, as well as accommodating actual attendees, incorporate all the experiences of, virtu of uh, virtual participation that we're learning from COVID-19's imposition of self-isolation. 
A few things of which I'm certain are that the UN Ocean Conference will be held in Lisbon, that the governments of Portugal and Kenya are determined to co-host a vibrant conference, and that like the first UN Ocean Conference, the Lisbon Conference will be another global game changer for ocean action. In Lisbon's case, rather than awareness of the need for ocean action, it will be the formulation of the solutions and partnerships that will see us through to achieving SDG 14 by 2030. And it'll do that by focusing on science and innovation. The Lisbon Conference will therefore represent a great start for the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which as you know, will run from 2021 to 2030. The UN General Assembly proclaimed the decade in order to fortify global efforts to reverse the cycle of decline from which the ocean's health is suffering and to gather us all behind a common framework to ensure ocean science is able to fully support countries in meeting the requirements of SDG 14. Make no mistake, the decade is a vital element in our struggle to ensure the ocean retains its coral, its myriad of ecosystems, its oxygen levels, and the integrity of its genetic material so that we can continue to exist on a healthy planet. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the central point of our gathering today, which is that ocean literacy is at the very bedrock of ocean action. It is the foundation upon which we will transform scientific knowledge into ocean action. It is the field upon which we inspire institutions, organizations, and individuals to join our efforts to contribute to the ultimate success of the UN Decade of Ocean Science. At its heart, ocean literacy, as has been said, is an understanding of our impact on the ocean and the ocean's impact on us. The idea is that our connection to the ocean should be as basic to our knowledge as understanding such fundamentals as where our nourishment comes from or how we're governed. There are seven principles of ocean literacy, of which scientists and educators agree everyone should be aware. For anyone out there who isn't familiar with them, I'll list them for you now. Principle one, the Earth has one big ocean with many features. Two, the ocean and life in the ocean shape the features of the Earth. Three, the ocean is a major influence on weather and climate. Four, the ocean made the Earth habitable. Five, the ocean supports a great diversity of life and ecosystems. Six, the ocean and humans are inextricably interconnected. And seven, the ocean is largely unexplored. I think you'd agree with me that any one of those principles is capable of taking you off on a blissful mental journey along a deserted beach strewn with flotsam or down through winding coral canyons filled with bountiful life. But stay with me here. I sometimes think of our relationship with the ocean as a mother-child bond. Born from the ocean, we've loved her unconditionally, and knowingly or not, have always been nurtured and inspired by her. But in our bold advancement, we have not always thought of our mother's best interests, sometimes forgotten her, and we've done things that have hurt her deeply. Thankfully, I believe we've woken up to our failings and are now on a quest to put things right with our mother. I'm not entirely satisfied with that interpretation, because the deeper I go, the less inclined I am to use a possessive in relation to the ocean. The whole Mare Nostrum approach has always seemed deeply flawed to me. The ocean exists with or without us. Yes, over time we can alter its chemical and ecological content with our polluting habits, but the ocean will always be the great reservoir of the planet's water. We, on the other hand, cannot presume to forever be the dominant species of Earth, especially if the bad habits to which I've referred continue uncorrected. As I've said, the first principle of ocean literacy is that Earth has one big ocean with many features. Please note my singular use of ocean. We have gulfs and bays and straits and seas, and yes, we have the North and South Pacific and the North and South Atlantic and the Indian, the Arctic and the Southern Oceans. But in reality, there's only one big body of water beyond terrestrial shorelines, and that is what we call the ocean. This is not an esoteric point. It's important that people understand the importance of the singular. I explain it to my grandchildren as the ocean being like a big bathtub. It swirls around at different levels with lots of things bobbing about in it. But if you pour a bucket of water into it, the overall level in the bathtub is going to go up. 
Thus, if you're living on an atoll out in the middle of the Pacific, with your whole existence depending on just a few meters of coral and sand elevation above the tide, you have a vital interest in the rate at which the melting Greenland ice cap is pouring its water into that global bathtub. It's not just sea levels that make understanding the use of the singular important. Pollution, heat, marine animals, and nutrients all move around the world through this one body of water, showing no respect to man-made boundaries of EEZs or historical nomenclatures. There is only one ocean, and everything within it is connected. Likewise, there is a constant amount of water on the planet that is circulating through the hydrologic cycle as liquid, ice, or vapor. By evaporation, condensation, precipitation, infiltration, surface runoff, and subsurface flow. As many of you know, I come from Fiji, and subsurface water flow is the source of Fiji's famous bottled water. When you live on the windward shore of a volcanic island like Viti Levu, my home island, the hydrologic cycle is clearly observed most days. As the sun rises up into the blue tropic sky, it heats the ocean surface and water evaporates upwards into white cumulus clouds that tower up ever higher and drift in on the trade winds across the harbor to bank up against thickly forested mountains. By mid-afternoon, the weight of all that water up there has incontinent consequences. Spectacular precipitation ensues, drenching the mountain flanks, turning drains and streams into torrents that spill down into the patient harbor, thence out through the broad passage of the main coral reef into the ocean, from whence all that H2O evaporated in the morning. There's one footnote that I'd like to add to that first-hand description of the water cycle which is the fact that as those torrents run, down, torrents run down to the sea, they carry with them excess fertilizers and nutrients, plastic rubbish, and industrial and urban detritus that were never meant to be present in the ocean. From the Pacific Islands to the great river basins of the continents, the rich to reef or sourced sea ethos is therefore something to which we should all espouse, a living rule which leads us to think of the ocean's well-being when we decide what to pour down our drains or discard from our lifestyles. At your peril, you may wish to point that out to the next person you see thoughtlessly discarding a cigarette butt onto a pavement. I know I'm preaching the choir when I say once again that human well-being, the ocean and the climate are inextricably linked. But it has to be said again and again that to our mutual detriment, for too long our economic, social and political systems have taken the ocean's vital ecosystems for granted. The ocean's production of oxygen, its regulation of climate, provision of energy, mineral and genetic resources, food, livelihoods, transport of goods, communication channels, cultural and recreational services, the list goes on and on. Those days hopefully are over. We've come to our senses with universal agreement to augment SDG 14 the UN's Sustainable Development Goal of conserving and sustainably using the ocean's resources. Our task over the next 10 years is to ensure we repay our immense debt to the ocean by faithfully implementing the goal's 10 targets. Ladies and gentlemen, let us acknowledge that there is still a disconnect between what ocean scientists know and what the general public understands. That cannot be good for the ocean and it cannot be good for us. So let us apply the UN Decade of Ocean Science to the fullest extent possible, globally, regionally, and through to community and individual levels. We have the virtual world of the internet as our medium, we have educational institutions, and we have well-honed lessons of ocean literacy. Creative minds and articulate voices are required. Let's get to work. One last thought from me. The ocean provides 90% of the living space for species on planet Earth. We are but one of those species. We know less about the ocean's depths than a sperm whale does. In our quest for ocean lit literacy, let's learn from them. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Um, that was an excellent and lively description of how important um, the ocean is uh, to us and to the planet. Um, and Peter referred to the seven principles of ocean literacy. And before we begin our panel discussion this morning, we're going to watch a short video um, which looks at the first 
principle of ocean literacy. The Earth has one big ocean with many features. Principle number one, the Earth has one big ocean with many features. The main message behind the first principle of ocean literacy is that we are all interconnected. The ocean is the defining physical feature on our planet, covering approximately 70% of the planet's surface and include the world's highest mountains and deepest valley. The ocean is the great unifier on this planet and this calls us all for a shared responsibility in cherish the ocean, in protecting the ocean, because whatever we do in one place will have an effect on the other side of the world and vice versa. It's not about the environment, it's not about the ocean, it's not about something abstract, it's about our lives. So what we do has an impact on somebody else and what somebody else does very far away from us has an impact on us. So it's about our very existence. we need to understand it. This to me is a key message. Many of us have personal experiences of the sea which remain with us even when we're not next to it. And one of the things that never ceases to amaze me is how the ocean has many different spaces, calm, serene, inviting, or sometimes rough, powerful, and scary, but it's always beautiful. We know our ocean faces many problems, as Peter said, Increasing amounts of warming and acidification that are causing coral reefs to bleach and pushing marine life to migrate or even die out. Eight million tons of plastic waste cluttering and poisoning our seas each year. Overfishing in places that can't sustain that level of activity and ships belching out polluting fuel emissions. We read about these issues and perhaps in the case of our participants today actually work on the problem. But for most people these challenges manifest in small ways whether it's increasing invasions of jellyfish that stop you swimming or sting you in the water, plastic straws, now face masks, and also fishing tackle littering a beach, or local streets on the coast flooding from a storm surge. I think that while nearly everyone loves the ocean, many people don't know what they can do to stop bad things happening to it. And here's where ocean literacy and our first panel discussion this morning comes in. It's all about how our ocean connects us and how leaders in different fields are developing and implementing solutions to protect it from the individual level to the national, regional, regional and global scale. So this morning, we'll first hear from experts in government, business and science who will talk about their own efforts to improve ocean literacy and to get more people involved in understanding and safeguarding this vital part of our planet's ecosystem. First of all, we're going to hear from each one of those experts, and then we will open up uh, for discussion with our experts. If people watching would like to ask questions, you can put those into the Q&A uh, box on the screen, and those will be sent to me, and I will try to put as many questions as possible to our panelists within the time that we have. Now, our panel today uh, consists first of a video message from uh, the president of Palau, then we will hear from uh, Ricardo Serral Santos, Minister of the Sea of Portugal, uh, followed by Helen Agren, who is Ambassador for the Ocean of Sweden, Chip Cunliffe, who is Head of Sustainability for AXA, the insurer, and Tyler Rachel, who is Member of the Early Career Ocean Professionals Group for the UN Decade of Ocean Science. So to begin with, we will have uh, our video message from uh, Thomas uh, Remengasau Jr., who is a Palau politician, uh, who's been the ninth president of Palau since 2013. During his administration, the South Pacific Island nation has become known as a leader on environmental initiatives such as the Micronesian Challenge and advocating awareness of global warming and its effects in the South Pacific region. We'll hear now from the president. Dear friends of the ocean, 
Ali from the Republic of Palau. We share one ocean. It connects us all. But we now know that our ocean is in crisis. And if we are to continue to prosper from it, we must act now to protect it. We must move from an ocean emergency to ocean prosperity, from treating the ocean as a disposable sink to treating it as a source for solutions to facilitate our sustainable development. Ocean literacy is a central part of how we make this transition. We cannot realize the ocean we want if we do not understand its riches, complexities, and fragility. Modern science tells us about the importance of marine protection to biodiversity, food security, and ecosystem resilience. How no-take protected areas like the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, which began its implementation phase at the beginning of this year, contribute to ocean health. 500,000 square kilometers of ocean are now off limits to fishing, a significant contribution to the global biodiversity target for protected areas. The High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy, which I co-chair with the Prime Minister of Norway, is another example of how science shapes ocean action. Over the past few months, the panel's work has been guided by the publication of a series of 16 blue papers, state-of-the-art synthesis of the science behind a range of ocean challenges and potential innovations and solutions. These blue papers are tools for ocean literacy that set out the ocean challenges we face. But they are also tools that provide recommendations for action to be agreed by the panel later this year. For many island peoples, the literacy of modern science is complemented by our traditional knowledge. When we set out our vision for the sanctuary in Palau, we were as much guided by the science as we were by a traditional method of conservation, the bull. The bull recognized the need to place certain areas off limits to fishing in order to give marine life time to recover and to preserve the long-term health of fish stocks and the marine ecosystem. The important thing about the bull is that it is not just a tradition to be recounted in stories or preserved in the museum, but something that can be applied in today's world. We were able to give a modern expression to this traditional concept in the sanctuary. Our modern bull recognizes the wisdom of our ancestors and our role as stewards of the ocean. These are values that go hand in hand with modern scientific knowledge, and we must be literate in both. At the end of this year, Palau will host the Our Ocean Conference 2020 a platform for stakeholders across governments, businesses, philanthropies, and civil societies to come together and make ambitious commitments to restore ocean health. Many commitments made in the past have focused on improving ocean science, research capacity, and ocean observation. As we look ahead to the start of the UN Decade of Ocean Science, I hope that in your plans to support its implementation, you will make the Our Ocean Conference the stage to share your commitment. Thank you very much, Komman Sula. Thank you very much uh, for that message, uh, President of Palau. And now we will proceed um, to hear from our live speakers this morning. Uh, we will begin with uh, Minister Sarao Santos, uh, Ricardo Serrao Santos has been Minister of the Sea for Portugal um, and was a member of the European Parliament between 2014 and 2019. He's Professor at the University of the Azores, where he served as Director of the Department of Oceanography and Fisheries and President of Imarimar, the Institute of Marine Research. Minister 
Could you tell us why ocean literacy is so important to Portugal and a little bit about what your country is doing to help its citizens become ocean literate and to empower the next generation to protect the ocean? Thank you very much, Megan. And, uh... Uh, happy ocean, or happy ocean day to all of you, and thank you to IOC and the partners for the organization of this meeting, and also a uh, special hello to Peter Thompson. Um, and uh, let me begin to recognize that investment ocean literacy is still set to tell, and you understand why I say that, of urgent priority when compared with other parallel systems like forest and woodland literacy, just to mention one. And let me tell that uh, the draft paper of the EU Green Deal, which is about mission on healthy ocean, seas, coastal, and land in England waters, uh, I'm on. Okay, and inland waters, argues that, and to me correctly, that the lack of adequate scientific understanding and public appreciation of ocean's key role has led to citizens' emotional and rational disconnection from these informants. In fact, except for a set of Ocean Funds Club, as we are, the ocean is still that strange system, opaque and invisible, that represents more dangers than goods. Tsunamis and hurricanes, I immediately understood it coming from the sea, while sunny time at the city, on landscape, the mount, on the mountain, at the garden of the house, this is not emotionally or rationally understood as connected to the sea. And in fact, the delay on citizens' emotional and rational connection to the ocean has been also responsible for lack of political action to protect and manage ocean waters, despite the great law of the sea of the United Nations that we have since many years. And ocean literacy based on knowledge and science is called to play a role in building these connections that we need of citizens to the ocean that will help to build the social consent that in democracy will support effective implementation of political decisions concerning our citizens. In that sense, ocean literacy is fundamental and most needed to, to inform citizens, but also to inform policymakers, general stakeholders, including the finances. And the 21st century is a time of changing. The tools uh, produced for governance by the end of the 20th century, it is with optimism that I see the relevance of the ocean being brought forward. Just see. One, the United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development integrates a standard objective on the ocean, life below water, and for the first time in the history of development and sustainable development agendas. The EU Green Deal identifies four missions to pursue, and one of them is on the ocean. The EU Horizon Europe for Science and Innovation identifies five missions, and one on the ocean. The deck of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development of IUC UN is also a major uh, issue. The program of the high level panel for sustainable ocean economy driven by government and, and finances, the UN Global Compact on the Ocean, and the initiatives of NGOs and foundations as the rise up call to action. The fact is, we have reached now the Anthropocene and the obvious solution to put the planet in track in safe track is a return to the ocean. I am optimistic, but without the sorority ocean literacy, it will be harder. The success for ocean, uh, ocean actions needed, literated citizens, literated economic and financial CEOs, literate policymakers. And now let's go to the second part of the question. In Portugal, and it is about Portugal, many of us feel particularly attached to the ocean. Due to our history, geography, and culture, we spend our holidays by the sea, and we love to eat seafood. Even so, we strive to build a past track to have a literate ocean society that goes beyond the memories of the past 
and their lines of poetry and incorporates also the science-based knowledge of the ocean. In 98, Mario Ruiz, late and dear friend of mine, which I'm sure many of you know in IOC and other forums, was pivotal in setting the International Year of the Ocean. He was also pivotal in the whole world exposition entitled The Oceans, a Heritage for the Future, held in Lisbon that same year, which became, with no doubt, a major event on ocean literacy. One of the infrastructures that came out of this Lisbon exposition, and that is today a landmark in the city of Lisbon and in ocean literacy, is the Oceanario de Lisboa, the Lisbon Oceanario. Oceanario that is visited by many, and also the Pavilion of Knowledge, which leads the life science program with a major de de sector dedicated to ocean literacy. I am certain that Mario Rubio should have been thrilled with the United Nations Decade of Ocean uh, Science for Sustainable Development. In Portugal, we set a major campaign that would also celebrate and disseminate the decade around the world. The voice through the ocean of our Navy school ship Sagres would celebrate the 500 years of the first ever made circumnavigation around the world by the Portuguese navigator Fernando Magalhães and finished by the Spanish captain Sebastián Alcano. This expedition was interrupted due to the COVID pandemic. It intended to get people to different cities where the ship venture involved in SDG 14 of the Decade of Sustainable Development and many aspects of global and uh, ocean history. We hope that it can be reinitiated in, uh, in June, in, uh, in August. Concerning young citizens in Portugal, the Ministry of Sea leads an educational program named Blue School, Escola Azul. The idea is that the school integrating the program develops a project about the ocean and relate things involving also local communities. The initiatives developed under this project later to children and teenagers, but also adults around promoting a better understanding of the ocean on everyday life bringing them close to the sea and encourage attitude towards this immense and unified space. We currently have more than 106 blue schools throughout the country and more than 20,000 students involved. The last challenge of the blue school team set the younger citizen was to know virtually how did they miss the ocean in this time of isolation of COVID. I would like to take this opportunity in finalizing to wish you all a safe journey during this crisis. A fruitful Oceans Day and to inform that this year we celebrate in Portugal the 25 years of the constitution of the World Independent Commission of the Oceans with a five minutes video launched precisely today in the World Oceans Day in our national TVs and social media and also to the website of this summit. This commission was shared by the cherished Portuguese president, Mario Soares, and coordinated by Mario Ruiz, comprised a, well, a group of well-known international experts that produced a report that set a milestone in the history of international governments of the ocean. The report shows the fundamental importance of the ocean and the sustainable sharing of its resources in the fight against hunger and poverty which remained a mathematically to be solved. It was written to be read by all of us, published in 98, but still updated. I recommend you delve into it. Thank you for this opportunity and congratulations for the organizations and thank you also for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Minister Santos. Um, I learned a lot from your uh, comments. I did not know that Portugal was so active and the, the blue schools sound uh, very impressive. And you also made a, a very key point about missing uh, the ability to go to the sea uh, during the confinement that we've, um, we've been following here in Spain. It is top of my list <laughs> as a place to go. Next, we will hear from Helen Agaren, who is the Ambassador for the Ocean at the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. She's worked for the Swedish government since 2000 in various positions on issues such as the green economy, consumption and production, climate mitigation and adaptation, research, innovation and local investment programs. Um, so, uh, Ambassador, please could you tell us 
why Sweden decided to get so involved in the international arena on ocean issues? And how do you coordinate your commitment to ocean literacy and ocean issues in general uh, between the national and the international level? Thank you uh, so much. First of all, I would like to say Happy World Ocean Day to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Uh, and uh, I would also like to thank UNESCO IOC and, and uh, all the partners in arranging this. Uh, you know, there have been, um, as Peter said, there have been uh, very many new virtual experiences during this pandemic. And um, perhaps now more than ever, we realize that we are all connected. And in, in, in spite of social distancing, we are closer than ever. So this is a fantastic moment to stress this and to reach out and talk about connectivity with, uh, 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 with the public and in a broad context. So um, as many of us don't really connect with the ocean in our daily lives, we can't see with our own eyes the changes taking place below the surface. And for a long time, the sheer uh, size or vastness of the ocean has uh, made many to feel unconnected to the sea uh, and uh, not really knowledgeable. So uh, we really need to, uh, that's why uh, ocean literacy is so important. But no matter uh, where we are on Earth, we are all intimately connected. Uh, as Peter said also, water moves through all ecosystems of the planet, linking the atmosphere, land, and oceans in an endless cycle. So that is why uh, what we do on land, sometimes far from the coast, ultimately will have negative impacts on the ocean. And the ever-increasing plastic pollution has really unveiled this fact to many. Uh, and as sad as the global problem with marine litter and microplastics is, it has opened the eyes to people um, to see the link between land and sea and to think more about production and consumption and to connect different groups of people and actors that are previously not maybe working together. Uh, so uh, when we talk about ocean and ocean literacy, a, a big part of this has to be uh, to have a source to see uh, approach. We need to understand the pressures and the drivers of problems we are experiencing in the sea, often originating somewhere else. And in this context, ocean literacy across sectors is really key for success. But the ocean uh, intimately uh, connects us to each other, both physically for example, by providing the routes of, of transportation across the globe. And sh shipping has uh, steadily increased over the past decade, driven by global trade. And Sweden is really an um, export uh, economy uh, dependent on global transportation and global trade. So it's an important issue. I think we have lost the ambassador's sound, if we could reinstate that. Is it okay now? Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, when we are looking for, uh, at, to the ocean to provide us with more food, uh, medicines, transport routes, um, and many services, uh, we need to do this in, uh, and involve all the stakeholders to do this in a more sustainable way. And I want to raise, um, um, say also that we are really happy in Sweden to host the World Maritime University and the Global Ocean Institute. Uh, they educate the future ocean governance and maritime leaders and have, with the support of Sweden and Germany, set up a land and ocean leadership program uh, aiming to educate um, uh, uh, on the implementation of, of Agenda 2030 in the maritime sector. But so the ocean also connects us indirectly in many ways. What I have on my plate uh, when I eat fish might be caught on, a, on, uh, on the other side of the globe. Um, and uh, we, we have to increase knowledge and information and transparency across supply chains 
to make it possible uh, for us to make uh, informed and responsible choices in our daily life decisions. And not the least, the ocean connects us also emotionally. The sea is beautiful, mysterious, uh, fun, and sometimes intimidating. Nobody who has truly experienced the ocean is unaffected. So uh, also finding new ways to reach out and, and to connect not only to the mind, but also to the heart of people, uh, and especially uh, youth, uh, I think is key to be successful in this endeavor. Uh, so, um, I would like to uh, finalize with um, uh, that to say that the uh, decade uh, of ocean science is a unique opportunity to increase awareness of the sea and find new cooperation and strengthen the knowledge and acceptance of bold decision making. Uh, Sweden has, during the last five, ten years, acted to strengthen and develop the work with ocean literacy nationally but also supported uh, the global efforts. Last week, we had an informal dialogue with key actors on ocean literacy in Sweden to inform ourselves about the relevant activities and, um, um, and the ocean decade. And the interest and enthusiasm was really fantastic. And Sweden is really committed uh, to be an active uh, partner in the decade for ocean science and ocean literacy will be uh, important and there are so many things going on. In Malmö, for example, they are working with the schools and educating uh, youth and they are appointing youth ambassadors uh, to, to help uh, inform and engage. Uh, there are efforts to, in science centers to, to develop uh, ocean science labs. Um, and uh, also programs developed to educate journalists. So there are a multitude of efforts that are now rolling out and, and huge engagement from different stakeholders in Sweden. So we are really looking forward to cooperating uh, during the coming uh, decade uh, on these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I was very interested to hear that there will be uh, efforts around uh, educating journalists as well. I definitely think, personally, I could uh, benefit from uh, better ocean literacy um, and so could our reporting um, in, in general. And there are so many exciting things going on um, and really I think there's a, there's a lot to look forward to in the coming decade. Um, Next, we're going to hear from Chip Cunliffe, who established and manages AXA's Ocean Risk Initiative uh, in the private sector, which works to promote ocean literacy as well as identifying innovative insurance and finance solutions uh, to the impacts and implications of ocean-related risk. And in 2012, this is interesting, ahead of many people perhaps, Chip set up AXA's Ocean Education Program to provide curriculum-led lessons and resources for schools drawing on ocean science research. He also co-chairs the Secretariat of the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance to help incentivize private investment and blended finance into coastal natural capital. Chip, could you tell us why you think the private sector should be involved in ocean literacy? And what is AXA doing to spread the word and encourage new projects uh, involving business? Megan, thank you very much indeed, and hopefully you can all hear me. Thank you also for uh, the privilege of, of being able to, to talk to you today. Um, before I answer your question, I'm just going to start with a, a fairly important fact, I think, one that we probably don't all know. Um, it was said by uh, Professor Ed Hill, who's the Chief Executive of the National Oceanography Centre here in the UK, um, and he said it in Paris in 2015, and he quoted the Grantham Institute study, which basically said that if the same amount of heat has gone, it's gone into the top two kilometers of the ocean between 1955 and 2010, had gone into the bottom 10 kilometers of the atmosphere, then the Earth would have seen a warming of 36 degrees. It's almost an incomprehensible number, um, but I think a very powerful message. And I think that um, we probably hear a lot about the, the macro level impacts of a changing ocean. Um, so whether it be coral reef health, whether it be deoxygenation, these things that probably people can't quite get their head around. Um, and I think for many people think that the ocean is probably out of sight and out of mind. I think it is. 
Um, so the key question for me, or one of them is, how do we develop a narrative, which I think is really part of what ocean literacy is, to help engage everyone from school children to risk managers to, to boardroom and governments as well. And as a, a teacher in a former life, um, you know, we're taught to, to differentiate our message depending on audience, as you do, Megan, um, within, as, as a journalist too. And I think the UN decade is really critical in providing us with the, the facts and figures and, and messages and examples and, and maybe the stark reminders and, and actually hopefully the rays of light that will help us to engage both audiences and, have, and, and produce really tangible outcomes. Um, as, as part of the insurance industry or reinsurance industry, I've always I've been often asked, you know, why we are working in, in the ocean or, or as part of it. Um, and I think that the direct link between ocean um, and, and, and the understanding of the drivers of risk are probably becoming more evident um, year on year. Um, after 25 years worth of, of ocean science research, um, we set up the or I set up the Ocean Risk Initiative uh, at AXA, um, and it really is, is to help us develop a more comprehensive, and I suppose actually more relevant ocean narrative as well. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure if someone can press a slide for me, but there's a, I'm just gonna ask for a slide to be pressed. Um, th there are two pillars to our initiative, um, well, in fact, there are three, but the, the first two, one is about catalyzing product innovation, uh, and the second is about um, driving the whole of the insurance industry response to ocean risk. Um, and the, both of those two things really link directly to a dollar figure. Um, and whether that's a risk from a, from a dollar perspective or an opportunity. And I think when you break it down, for us, this is absolutely critical. We, we need to resonate our commitment and our communication with our audience, both internally as colleagues um, but also externally with, with potential with clients and, and others as well. Uh, it's not just about the dollar figure, of course. We are also very conscious of our social responsibilities to our communities, um, to the environment and biodiversity, which again is a, a key part of AXA's climate change um, focus too. So just to take that a step further, um, a little bit more context. We, we know that, or it's estimated that 800 million people will be at risk from coastal flooding from storm surges um, by about 2050, small island developing states and least developed countries will be most affected. Um, also, that in the last 10 years or so, insurers have paid out more than $300 billion for coastal storm damage. But we also, all, uh, we, we also know that sovereign states and taxpayers will have paid out significantly more. Um, and, and, and certainly as the insurer of last resort, that is not sustainable in the future. Um, so it is a significant risk to both our clients and our business um, and exactly the reason that we have this ocean risk initiative. So we are starting to, to move on various things. We have an ocean risk index that we're developing where we're able to, where we're going to start to look at being able to accurately price flood risk with and without ecosystems. So you take away your mangroves and your coral, or your coral reefs. Um, and what does that mean for your exposure for your um, for, for, for either communities or a, an asset on, on, on land. We're working to develop uh, blue carbon resilience credits and the resilience piece is about companies investing to restore protection to limit the risks of storm surges and flooding. We're focusing on parametric insurance products. Um, so what opportunities are there in, in the coral reef space uh, and mangroves as well? Um, we, as, as you um, said at the beginning, we're working to, uh, as a founding partner of, of the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance, backed by all the G7 countries, which is really a, a multi-sectoral collaboration designed to drive um, $500 million worth of investment into nature-based solutions by 2030. Um, and we're also working with the Simpson Center on pieces of the risk at least, least, un, or least known. Um, and that's looking at political, environmental, and social vulnerabilities in cities. Um, I think it's really key that all of those things that I've just uh, outlined um, have, it's all based on data, scientific data. So, you know, the UN decade is, is absolutely critical in providing that. If you can just go to the next slide, that'd be great. Thank you. 
Um, the third pillar of, of our uh, initiative is about ocean literacy more specifically. Um, and that is a, a, forms a core part of our corporate responsibility. Um, AXA Ocean Education, uh, we launched in 2012. Uh, so far, 7 million children around the world in 96 different countries have, have used um, our, uh, our materials, which is fantastic. We want to try and drive that uh, further. We help to um, integrate the ocean into uh, the UK's curriculum during the curriculum cr review in 2014 with our partner, uh, Encounter EDU. And we also, um, we also provide funding for PhDs through our ocean risk scholarships. Um, everything from informing aquaculture to modelling icebergs in the Atlantic, etc. But I think that the final part of that, for, the final part of the, the ocean literacy uh, pillar, is very much about hel helping colleagues to think more about the ocean when taking business decisions, and that's very much a longer term aim. Uh, that can't be done uh, almost overnight. That's very difficult. So we're, we're we're starting to do that now. But I think the UN DEC is really key to developing and integrating that ocean literacy into formal education around the world, and we're very keen to and help to help um, to do that. But I think, I go back to my, my first point about engaging others within the private sector, and I think it's about identifying that differentiated narrative. Um, and I really believe that the DECA can help us provide the toolkit uh, with which we can do that. Thank you. Chip, thanks very much. AXA is obviously uh, doing a lot in this space, and um, it's very good to hear that there are also financial incentives uh, for protecting the oceans. But in order to realize the potential, we do need more data, we need more understanding and more awareness, um, and that will presumably come uh, in the next decade um, as we get all this additional expertise and understanding. So now we're going to hear from a scientist, Tyler Ray Chung, who is a young advocate, marine scientist, and an active member of the Early Career Ocean Professionals Working Group for the Fiji Islands. Uh, she's also a technical advisor with the Pacific Youth Council and aims to bridge the gaps between policymakers, young scientists, and young people to ensure they're actively engaged in decision making to secure a safe, transparent, and healthy ocean for future generations. Tyler Ray, what does it mean for a young marine scientist like yourself coming from the Pacific Islands to join an international program like the UN Decade of Ocean Science? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Please go on. Okay, okay. sorry. Thank you, Megan. Um, so on Friday, our PM declared um, Fiji COVID free. And as a young person in science, I'm hopeful for the opportunities in the future um, around ocean, but I'm also driven because of the demand and push to bridging scientific knowledge and, and traditional knowledge together. And I think as a young person, as a young marine scientist coming from the Pacific, being part of the early career ocean professionals group for the UN Decade of Ocean Science, I think it's a good opportunity to, you know, when you talk about oceans connecting us, this is, this is what it really means is oceans connecting us virtually as we sit here today and um, being part of it. I would like to start, I would just like to start off by saying that ocean literacy, as, we, as you have mentioned, is understanding our influence on the ocean as, and the ocean's influence on us. This statement, however, is not something new, especially in the Pacific region, as um, understanding the role of our oceans is part of our identity and something that is ingrained in us at a young age. So from our indigenous ways of traditional navigation, of sustainable sea or sustainable sea transportation to setting up a no-take zone or a tambu area known in Fiji, which is a particular boundary within a coral reef or a portion of fishing ground, a particular time frame, to sustainable fishing practices has been passed down through generations by means of storytelling and hands-on experience, has taught us to understand the significant role our ocean plays for our survival and how we should act as custodians to sustain, sustainably protect the future of our oceans. And um, I think it, the traditional knowledge of the past and the ever-growing scientific knowledge of the present must be merged intricately so that the responsibility is shared at all levels, from grassroots to global, bridging past and present for a global vision for our oceans. And um, today I can confidently say that as we gather virtually, our oceans has already connected us 
to create waves of change. And the UN Decade of Ocean, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development has given each of us time, time for young people and leaders to connect and challenge us to innovate without being destructive. Um, as an early career ocean professional, we act as decade ambassadors, bringing together expertise from diverse backgrounds, disciplines, sectors, and regions eager to contribute to the decade and the sea of life that connects each of us. And um, through, global, through global consultation in coordination with the Intergovernmental Oceanography Commission, um, we, the ECOP Working Group, have identified initiatives. And among these initiatives, hosting uh, youth engagement events and to the decade, related to the decade, and supporting campaigns on ocean literacy can make a crucial contribution to the decade. Um, because we believe that the dissemination of scientific information plays such an integral role for the sustainability of our ocean and the legacy after the decade as well, from grassroots level to global, sharing the responsibility between young people and leaders, scientists, people in communities who depend on the ocean more than a person collecting the data, holding the richness of traditional knowledge and the importance um, is important for a global vision of our ocean. Um, being part of ECOP has really, has really inspired me or given me hope, and this decade also has given me hope that the leaders are ready to listen and the young people are ready to take the stand as future generational leaders. And so having this, um, having ocean literacy is important, but it's also about understanding, it's also understanding not just what our ocean is or how it works, but it's also understanding the people that depend on the ocean. So this information can be disseminated clearly. Sometimes we, you know, we get caught up with all the problems of the present and the solutions we develop and actions we create. We sometimes forget the most important players who are the communities of people that depend on the ocean and the marine life and its ecosystems that sustain us. So I think from my point of view that this, you know, it's also this pandemic has taught us to slow down and appreciate our natural resources within our oceans. And it challenges us as young scientists to innovate and to push ourselves, not just to change our lifestyles, but also our scientific technologies so that we're able to gather information, you know, collect the data and turn that information clearly enough for people from global, national, regional, and community level to understand. Because I think language plays a huge role. The language that we speak at an international International panel is a very different language that I speak when I go into coral restoration with the communities in um, in the areas in Fiji. So I think it's that information or disseminating that information that's important. So um, yes, thank you. Thanks so much, Tadore. Um That's a really good overview um, of your work. And, um, you know how we get from the global level down to the community level. Now, we don't have a lot of time left for this particular panel because we've had uh, such a wealth of uh, good uh, contributions from our speakers. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask you one question each or summarize some of the questions that have come in and direct them to you in turn so that you can uh, sort of try and give an answer and also maybe um, a couple of final thoughts. So I think I'll start with Tyler Ray because um, we've had uh, a question from a 14-year-old ocean ambassador in Hong Kong uh, who is saying, I would like to know what do you think youth can do uh, to contribute to ocean conservation? And we've also had a couple of questions about um, indigenous and uh, traditional communities as, as, as was described in the question. Um, what are the um, opportunities and the difficulties of uh, improving ocean literacy for those communities? Perhaps you can talk about that a little bit more from your own experience as you were just saying about the need to use different language and so on. Thanks. Okay, um, so the first question was what youths can do for ocean conservation? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, youths are ever growing, and I think that, you know, one of the main points of youth is to just really, it's about talking and it's about leading by example. You know, we watch our leaders every day, and we also see the mistakes that our leaders may make and the people around us that make, and we can correct them. And by correcting them is being open, being humbled, and understanding 
you know, the ocean and just, just really just talking about it and creating movements of, of change, just creating ways of change through just through your own little group, with your own little community that you can do because, you know, you are a ripple in this, you're a ripple ready to make big ocean waves. So I think youth can contribute in terms of, in terms of mobilizing, in terms of disseminating information, the way youths are good at using social media technologies that we have, you know, making it fun and innovative. Like young people are so creative. It's just about using that creativity and incorporating it with the science that you learn from schools and the ocean that you're passionate about and how you can just merge them all together to just be simple. You, young people are so simple. You know, we have our leaders to be uh, politically correct to implement plans and all we're doing is we're we're actioning out those plans we're achieving the goals that have been that have been set before us that we're the ones that are going to be doing it and i think it's important that we need to start being involved um in decision making processes because at the end of the day after the decades as people you know leave and and grow go on it's the young people who are going to take who are going to be rolling these strategies out especially with the current un decade that's been set in place for the next 10 years absolutely and and with regard to indigenous and traditional communities um who are living and working with the ocean i i wonder whether there's even a need for more ocean literacy among these communities they're the ones who know it best right and maybe there's a lot that the rest of us who do have this disconnect can actually learn. And how do we get that knowledge to the wider world? Um, wow, okay, that's it. How do I, how do I shorten this? So, um, as a marine scientist, from my own experience, you know, graduating um, with a degree in marine science, I go into communities thinking that I know every scientific, every scientific thing about the ocean. And then I get retaught, and I sort of get sort of, how do you say this, like sort of slap back saying that, you know, you may know conservation the way you know conservation, but traditionally in our communities, this is how they conserve things. And I think it's important to, to understand, I'm sorry, you're lagging. I don't know if I'm lagging as well. No, you're good. Okay, yeah. So, um, so in terms of traditional knowledge, I think it's just with language. You know, we have these SDG, in my experience, SDG 14 that we have, you have so many targets and so many things to achieve through those targets. And it's, it's, translating, that, it's translating that information on, on the SDG 14 page to the community level, because if you, if you just share, if you listen to their stories that they share, you can start picking off certain targets that they've achieved in their own communities, in their own way. So it's not, it's from the bottom to the top. It's having that information from the bottom to the top. And as a young scientist, I'm pretty sure I can say I learned the hard way to um, push back my science and to understand more of the traditional knowledge that we have in place and to link it. It's just really about listening to each other and using languages to get information across. So in indigenous, it's, yeah, so um, I'm part of the, um, a sailing, a traditional navigation crew. And uh, with all the science that I've learned from, from uni, being on that, you know, using the winds and using the stars to navigate has taught me so much more about the ocean, that it's so much bigger than ourselves. And, you know, even though we collect data out of it, you know, to graduate and to, to gain credibility, and to you know, for money for, for extraction, it's it's more than that because in the end it teaches you respect, humility, and it really it really makes you understand who you are in this vast ocean. Thank you, Tyler Ray. I think that uh, I hope that we can get more of those stories, more of that knowledge out during the coming decade. Chip, um, if I could come to you now and just ask. Um, what does that to do also around uh, increasing literacy for um, you know some of the financial products and the business concepts that you're working on? Um, because I think you know a lot of the general population maybe doesn't know that much about blue carbon and and, and you know some of the risks uh, that you you've been talking about. Do you have plans to 
to educate us all um, about these kind of products. The other reason we set up um, the, the alliance um, was to help us to develop a narrative and, and a, a platform to help to, uh, to, to drive this into different, um, into different places. I think that we're at the very beginning of all of this, of course. Um, so parametric insurance where you, you pay out when you, you hit a certain parameter um, is fairly new. Um, and we're starting to, to develop all of these different products, finance products. Um, so it's not just insurance, it's, it's, it's blended finance as well. And I think there's a real need to, uh, to to drive that forward as quickly as possible and scale it as quickly as possible as well. But as I said, I mean, I, I think the difficulty here is that it's it's uh, it's it's fairly new, um, and we're we're all learning. We're all on that journey together. Um, ideally, we'd be sort of uh, you know 10 years in advance of where we are now, but we're not. Um, so, but it's it's the it's the likes of ourselves and. Um, and others within the, the insurance and finance industry that, that, are, that are starting to drive these things forward. Um, and I think it's that innovative focus that we all have to, to, to make a difference um, is going to be really key. So, yeah, I, I, it, yes, of course, we want to, to engage as widely as possible. Yes, we'd want to, uh, uh, to do that alongside yourself um, and yourselves in, in the sort of the, the, the um, within the journalist community, um, we're doing as much of that as we can within the uh, within the sort of the, the scientific uh, NGO and and um, I suppose the po policy and governance is is other, the other space that we need to drive this message. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but you know, yes, we are certainly starting to starting to do that. Thank you so much, Chip. And I'll bring in um, our two uh, ministers um, at the end here and just wrap up a couple of questions um, and perhaps each of you uh, can respond. Um, we've had one question around, um, you know, the likely uh, rise in plastic waste, which is related to the coronavirus pandemic, um, and whether there is anything that governments uh, can do about that to prevent more pollution. So that is one question. Um, and the second question is around what more can be done to prevent um, illegal activities affecting uh, the ocean. So perhaps you could just uh, fill us in a little bit on your priorities around those issues. If we could start with Helen, if she's still there. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I mean, there are many things you could do from the government perspective, uh, fighting plastic pollution. Uh, we have to move towards a circular economy, and in that work we need to involve business, of course, creating new materials that are biodegradable. We have to, to get the waste management systems in order to, to, to make it possible to, to have a circular economy and much more. And we need global, a global framework uh, on plastics which we, and micro, microplastics, which we, which we don't have today. Uh, and fighting uh, illegal activities, uh, there we have the science and data and new technologies that really uh, could help us with satellites and different sensors and, and autonomous um, um, underwater uh, or, or drones, etc. That could really help us cover larger areas and um, uh, perform surveillance um, at sea. Uh, and if I sh could just comment uh, finally on, on, on the youth perspective, because it's very, very close to my heart. One of the most rewarding jobs I've had uh, was when I have been working at educating young people about peace, environment and democracy and how this is all interlinked. And, and um, I think it's important with young people to not underestimate the power they have and to learn about the democratic system, how, how you can engage in different ways, whether it be uh, um, uh, aligning with businesses or, or uh, influence your, your local policymaker or approach the parliament, etc. So learn about the decision making processes where you are get engaged and, and become political. Uh, uh, there are lots of opportunities to, to, to take part in changing the world. Many thanks, Ambassador. And Minister Santos, if I could just bring you in um, to make some final comments on 
what you've heard, uh, anything in particular you wanted to pick up on, but also perhaps to uh, quickly tell us about your, your hopes and aspirations for the summit um, when it is actually able to, to take place. Thank you. Uh, the, the, I understand this uh, and uh, I promote this as, uh, as uh, an interruption that we had, of course. It affected all the conferences that were uh, in the agenda for uh, 2020 and it had to be postponed. And uh, the pandemic had a lot, a lot of other side effects. And I would like to comment on the ones you mentioned, the issue of, of plastics, because now, in fact, the protection uh, mechanism like much for the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the liquids that we are using, we have to be single of process. And it is, it's come to our knowledge that uh, these plastics are uh, being thrown away in a uh, not proper manner. So, in terms of government, we have to control that, that, that because it, is, uh, 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 it shows that we are, uh, the, the society, the, the citizens are not well prepared, not well informed for the, the, the dangers and the reasons of this. Um, of this uh, the other side that we can read in the FAO already a report that an increase in the on IU fisheries and in illegal in illegal procedures. But of course poverty and anger eventually have been increased in this stage of it. And uh, uh, we hope that this goes uh, by that we can return to uh, our activities with a new vision of course. And I think that some issues are emerging that we need even to short, uh, short distance markets. We need to focus on um, uh, when the, the tourism uh, returns to focus on, on tourism that increase protection of marine visitors and the protection of, uh, of, of the coast and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the sea. And uh, uh, we need, in fact, uh, to, to, to learn what happened to this environment in this short time. And, in terms of, of science and uh, knowledge, uh, I think this is an opportunity of a time, and I hope it is only a opportunity of the of a time it does not happen again, that uh, uh, we should monetize and uh, return to our ecosystems to understand how they have uh, reacted to the interruption of a set of activities, from noise, uh, from uh, fishing, from a uh, lot of activities, and how uh, it, uh, they, they become resilient or even they um, return to more more production and protection. And uh, I think that a lot of things we left we have learned from, from this and uh, that we have to ch change some of the routes and the tracks that were 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 building our our society and uh, and uh, that we have to have uh, more investment in biotechnology and the ocean is a major a source of um, genetic material in terms of the diversity of genetic material. Um, there is more phyla in the in the ocean than in other, other and on land systems. Or, or eleven of the animal phyla only exist in the ocean. So we should invest really uh, strongly. Uh, in terms of if we want to find methods for the of some diseases, but uh, we have to find also the uh, investment uh, in on finding opportunities of the world economy. And I think uh, that here, yeah, as I said on my intervention, we are on the right track with um, um, the convergence of interest so from the business. Uh, and uh, ocean uh, compact, uh, uh, sector just for business, the high level panel on um, uh, sustainable uh, economy, and whole NGOs very active, and politicians looking to the environment and uh, Thank you. Minister, thank you so much indeed uh, for those important points. I won't summarize what's been said because we've run over time a little bit, um, but just to say that I have learned a huge uh, amount from this uh, panel. And I think it's very inspiring that um, there are so many different communities willing uh, uh, 
and, and absolutely raring to go in terms of pushing forward on this work. Um, and there's a great deal um, that uh, will be realised in the coming decade. Um, and hopefully we will all, all end up feeling a much stronger connection um, with the ocean that means so much to us. And with that, I would like to thank all the panellists um, and also the contributions questions um, from uh, those watching and hand back to Francesca. Thank you very much indeed. And happy World Oceans Day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you to the panelists. It was really a great panel with different perspective and backgrounds. That's what we want, actually, and that's the power of ocean literacy, to be able to bring together people from different perspectives and different backgrounds. We currently have uh, 525 participants online uh, on the platform. We already had uh, 1,600 people registered. People have contributed with their resources, their materials, videos. So we are really happy to see the level of engagement of people coming from all around the world. Uh, we will give you more information. Please tweet uh, on this summit. Use the hashtags Ocean Literacy, Ocean Decade, and Generation Ocean, and drop the S. Remember to drop the S in Ocean. We are part of this campaign. And now I'm, I'm very happy to introduce Justin Worland, who will be the moderator of the second panel.